Hi, this is Rick, and this is Burn After Reading. This isn't going to be a long episode. I just wanted to inform you, the listener, of what I plan to do in the next few months, along with giving you a strong podcast episode recommendation, one that I feel is vital regarding the West Memphis 3 DNA retesting fiasco. Having said that, let's get on with it. After many odd and suspicious failed petitions filed by child murderer Damien Eccles' lawyer, it looks like they finally filed one correctly. Um, Judge Tanya Alexander has set a June 23rd hearing for Eccles' petition for retesting. I'm very curious to see how this plays out because my understanding is that the West Memphis Three waived those rights under the conditions of their Alford plea in 2011. I would assume the judge will rule accordingly, but... Hey, weirder things have happened. Let's just say by chance the judge rules in Eccles' favor. The technique that is that they want used is MVAC, and you might be asking, well, what is MVAC? Well, to those who don't know, and just to put it simply, the MVAC system is a wet vacuum-based forensic DNA collection device that is helping investigators solve more crime. And so, what is what does Eccles want retested? You might be asking that. Well, they're not retesting all the evidence, just these, the ligatures used to tie up the boys during the crimes in 1993. Now, here is one of the most common responses I get in my comment section. If the West Memphis Three are guilty, why does Damien want the evidence retested? And when people write that, they, I think they convince themselves that they just hit a checkmate. I mean, I get it. The perception, I I do. I can understand why they would think initially, why would a a guilty man want evidence retested? And that's why I always use the term perception isn't always reality. Let's consider a few things. Damien isn't trying to get everything retested, as I stated before, just the ligatures. Why just that? Ask yourself this. Why not the pants with the possible semen stain? Oh, you know the one. Uh, The one where Jesse said in one of his confessions that Damien wiped his penis on the pants of one of the boys after ejaculating. When initially tested, uh, they couldn't get a conclusive match of what that was. Um, Why? Because it was submerged in water for nearly 18 hours. They couldn't get an exact mark of what it really was. But hey, you know, you would think with this MVAC test, surely they could pull someone's DNA from that, right? Right? Nope, not wasting their time on that one. Let's understand something, and let's be very clear about it. Environmental factors such as heat and humidity can accelerate the degradation of DNA. DNA is vulnerable. It breaks down in sunlight and, like I said before, water. And there are enzymes that naturally destroy it. This wasn't evidence found in a dry house. Remind yourself of that. This is evidence found outside and submerged in muddy water for nearly 18 hours. The idea that people think perfect DNA was going to be collected then, let alone 10 years, 15 years, or nearly 30 years, is absolutely baffling to me. And that's the point. Damien and his legal team already know that nothing is going to show up, at least nothing conclusive. Why? It was already retested by Bow Technology. They also know that water destroyed an incredible amount of evidence, and time didn't do it any favors. There's nothing to lose here for Damien. If retesting happens and nothing definitive is found, and when I mean by definitive, I mean, hey, you might get an DNA here or there. That's not conclusive, mind you. But anyways, say nothing definitive is found... Damien gets to prance around victorious and proclaim the same nonsense he has done for years that him and, of course, his two cohorts couldn't have possibly had anything to do with it. Now, if retesting is denied, he gets to blame the evil and corrupt justice system. And because of that, the Innocence Project, they get to keep doing what they are doing. And, oh, in case you don't know, pro-West Memphis 3 Innocence fans, in case you don't know, Who co-founded that? That was Barry Sheck, uh, the guy who served on the O.J. Simpson Dream Team. The same guy who tried to discredit the obvious DNA found at the Brown and Goldman crime scene, O.J.'s vehicle, and his house. I mean, we all know how innocent O.J. Simpson is, right? And maybe, just maybe, step back and really consider who you think is innocent and who is really guilty. 
Anyways, regarding the West Memphis 3 DNA propaganda issue, I want to defer to someone who is far, and let me emphasize far better, at going over this than I am. If you're listening, and if you haven't already checked this person's episode out, it is imperative to anyone who cares about knowing the truth about this case, does so ASAP. I'm talking about Lisa O'Brien of Based in Fact, a true crime podcast. She goes over this in extensive detail. Now, who is Lisa? She is a legal assistant slash paralegal and a general know-it-all who quite frankly knows her shit and has researched this case for quite some time. I am providing links below as to how you can listen to her episode. Feel free to check, you know, check out her other episodes too. Um, She talks about other crimes. Look, please, I would rather you from this point on stop listening or listen to the rest of this episode later and check that out. It's long. It's over two hours, I think, but it's worth it. It's worth it if you really want to know the truth, especially about the whole DNA fiasco. I, I would, I can't imagine it couldn't change some of your perceptions. All right. Having said that, as For what I'm going to do in the next few months, um, I am planning a part five of Perception Isn't Always Reality, the West Memphis Three. With that, I plan on going over misconceptions perpetuated by filmmakers, a journalist, lawyers, and experts. That will wrap up the West Memphis Three series. Um, I should have that up hopefully by the end of April or the beginning of May, um, bearing any kind of unexpected issues. There's another thing I plan to address in the future, and that is Anthony Greeno, a one-time Dog the Bounty Hunter wannabe and so-called investigative reporter who I, along with others, feel is exploiting the murders of Abby and Libby of the Delphi case. He claims he's an intricate part of the investigation, but instead he's just making a lot more noise and he never lets an opportunity to collect money pass him by. As far as this whole Greeno thing, I, you know, I don't plan to make this a series, um, j- just a one episode thing once I come across it, or I come across to making it, but I'm going to go over his history um, with everything from being a so-called bounty hunter to investigative journalist, um, and and just kind of just give more of a summary. There are other people currently right now who are going over it, like almost like three or four hour um, episodes. It's it, it's so it's pretty extensive there. I just want to summarize it. After that, hopefully, be done with it. And um, oh, <laughs> forgot to mention this. He's currently in jail. Um, and if you can believe it, he's still making content. And you're probably asking yourself, well, how? Well, his current girlfriend is helping him run episodes while he calls in while imprisoned. <laughs> and I'll tell you, the truth truly is stranger than fiction. Um, In the future, I'd also like to cover the New England Patriots Spygate scandal and the Tom Brady's uh, Deflategate scandal. I think there's some misconceptions there that need addressed. I know this is moving away from the true crime stuff, but it stays within the parameters of perception isn't always reality. I'm considering covering the Stephen Avery case sometime down the road, but, you know, that's a large undertaking. Not sure if I'll be able to get to that one, but it's it's something I'm considering. Anyway, that's it for now. Until next time.